I think, I mean, I think this Australia story is kind of a, a good segue into our uh, our deep dive on just kind of the use of, we could broadly say maybe biometrics, we could say um, any kind of like physically, personally identifiable information, maybe we'll coin a new term with that one. Um, but whether it's kind of the the Amazon story from a couple of weeks ago about $10 for your handprint, all this facial recognition story, I saw a wild tweet um, earlier this week. Um, there was a school district, um, I forgot the name of it, but for their sake, I guess I won't even mention it, um, that was uh, proudly um, advertising about how they've in introduced facial recognition for um, contactless um, meal purchases at the school, right? So these are kids now that you're obviously saying it's a school district doing it, um, that's implementing the facial recognition. And, you know, obviously we know that the school district didn't build this application and it's not storing it in-house, it's built by some um, some technology firm or consulting firm, and that data is probably stored in some public cloud somewhere. And so, I mean, it's um, I think it's a really slippery slope. I mean, we've always been worried about kind of our digital footprint, um, but I think we got to start worrying about our physical footprints too nowadays because, you know, they're trying to tie the two closer and closer together. And so that's kind of a, I don't know, weird situation. But what are your thoughts on just kind of this physical blend of surveillance before we thought it was all digital and if you walk around on the street you're perfectly fine but now we're seeing that that's not really the case there's a lot of physical aspects that are being tracked it's already you know, i think in in motion whether we like it or not and and look at various aspects of uh, biometric right uh, face id is is one one form of identification uh, like with touch id thumbprint and whatnot is you know has made its way into hundreds of millions of phones so that's another form of identica identification then with Amazon thing, you have the entire palm, palm print. And that's another form of identification. Then there is voice. Voice is another form of identification that's already in there. Like the so-called smart speakers now will automatically determine who is asking the question and an answer with their with their name in there. I mean, that is considered a you know, feature or a security feature. So if you look at all of these forms of, uh, of uh, you know, biometric information, private companies have this information. And I'm sure the retina scan and all of that is just a matter of time before before they make it. So these are all forms that are already in place. And now it is in the hands of private companies. Whatever happens with that, I mean, our first mm -hmm. thing is, how are these companies protecting this information? It is probably in their best interest to protect their information if they are in that business, but some of them are not. They are in the, they are in the I guess, a data brokerage uh, you know, business where these providers of biometric authentication systems will will be the equivalent of single sign-on for the web. Uh, so, because biometric is one form of authentication that that we do, are there any legislations that restrict some of it, restrict the usage of it? No, I don't think there are, and or at least there has to be more stringent verification, and that will become an increasingly important issue when you consider the fact that co companies are collecting information across geographies. Like how comfortable will, say, you know, an American be when an American residing in Australia has Australian, uh, you know, all, all this information, facial ID and being tracked and whatnot. Right? Will, and, and if it is hosted there, how comfortable uh, will they be? So, and these are going to be the tensions that will come up moving forward because of the way we have centralized a lot of these. And that's the reason I'm saying we'll move towards the decentralization. But biometric, you know, if you, if you step back and think about it, what is the information that we have about ourselves that we haven't provided to these technology providers? That's a good question to ask. Or what percentage of our own personal information is not available to these technology providers? And that includes the, the physical or biometric information like face ID, thumb ID, voice, and whatnot. If you look at all of these, then you'll be surprised that they probably know 80, 90% of, of mm. uh, information about us that knowingly or unknowingly we have provided that. And, and that, is a, that is a scary part. How are they taking care of it? Because all of this information is, is uh, you know, in, a, in a central place. It's just a one leak away or one partnership away from leaking it to the public. Uh, that That is a scary part. I, I would say you said 90%. Let's say that that's right. You know, they have 90% of it. As more 
of our interactions become digital, that number just goes up. And I don't know about you, but I don't sit around analyzing my own, you know, behaviors and, and things like that. I just use different things, you know, and a lot of these things are digital and they're creating these footprints and, and little crumbs which are being picked up by these companies and they literally know more about me and my behaviors and, and my tendencies than I do, because I'm not sitting around studying in my own tendencies, but they are because they're looking for ways to get more of my attention and convert on all this data that they have. So let's say 90% now in a couple of years, that 90, 90% is probably going to be like, 95 96 7 and i go back to what's going on with australia they they're basically saying you're going to have to download this app and use it so that we can have that so we can keep tabs on you basically that is uh, i'm still stuck on that is some scary stuff that is that enough to make people think about leaving a country when your privacy is that um, taken for granted or taking over, this is amazing what's going on today. Yeah, I mean, I think what you said uh, last about leaving a country is kind of important. I mean, honestly, I would say even if we take it from the U.S. perspective of states, you know, every state will have its own rules and regulations and policies towards things and kind of, you know, I think now that things are a little bit more digital for a vast majority of people, the ability to move around um, and still either maintain your current job or find a new job in the new area is a little bit easier. Um, but I mean, you got to balance like people have roots in certain areas and you shouldn't be forced to leave. But the best way to really is kind of vote with your feet, right? Like there's two ways, either you dig your heels in and try to make policy changes locally, or you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go somewhere that aligns with my values. Right. And maybe we'll have countries on, all ends of the spectrum that are basically, you know, privacy first, or maybe um, security first, or maybe um, government controlled more, right? And whichever one you think aligns with kind of the way you like things to be run, some people might like the China method of, you know, handling a situation and having like authority and control and, um, you know, maybe decisiveness. Some might like the American, um, I don't know if anybody likes the American system of bureaucracy, but some might find it interesting, um, you know, or some European options or maybe even, you know, emerging markets like Africa or uh, what do you call uh, Pacific Islands could be really big game changers in this. Like Singapore, I think, um, earned a lot of goodwill in general for the way they um, approach solutions to different problems, like as political problems or in general, um, how they treat their uh, citizens. And so we could start just seeing a shift and, and ultimately we'll see what's the winning solution because at the end of the day i think only the country can protect you so you really have to be like aligned with somewhere that that country has the citizens best interest at heart and your kind of ideals align and if that requires uprooting at some point someone has to make that call right i think it's easier said than done but i think that's probably where we're going from or going towards with kind of the growth of like these digital nomads you should be able to function from anywhere but um the protection you'll choose where you want to stay based on um those rights that you get but regarding that voting with your feet uh, and going back to that article about Australia, uh, it looks like it's not pretty straightforward to just walk out of the country. You have to I mean, you physically country. can't. You have to take a boat or a plane. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, they're, they're basically saying uh, citizens are restricted and you have, to go through, you, have to, you have to go through some and you have to be part of a certain list to even leave the country. So they have restricted that part too. So I think there are... Uh, <laughs> Well, you can't even can leave you, if you want you can to physically leave, but does you does your data stay with them? I mean, if they've already got certain pieces of your data there, I can't imagine. Oh, you're leaving. You're not a citizen anymore. All right, we're gonna give you your data. The only copy of your data. I don't think so. Yeah, and going back to the to the biometric part, right? Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm thinking about, or at least kind of worrying, is the identity identity of an of an individual typically when you are trying to log into your digital profiles and whatnot right you you look at uh, authentication we say hey two factor authentication is secure or three factor authentication is secure if you step back and say what are these factors right the factors are num uh, what you know that's number 1 number 2 what you have and number 3 is who you are 
these are basically considered three factors of authentication individually they may be secure but as a combination they are uh, they are more secure uh, they are they are uh, so that really authenticates that it's you right now if you look at each of these uh, individually and and how or to what extent these these providers have access to that data if you look at what you know that is the password and what not all of the the monopolies today and the surveillance vendors they run the authentication system you log into your google account you log into your facebook account apple account or, or what not right they have that information about what you what you know that is the password and authentication mm. then you're talking about what you have and for the most part your phone is becoming the id for everything be it digital wallets be it uh, you know various other uh, things where you just scan your phone to you know walk into a to an airport or walk into a office and what not so the physical device is something that is being used for for that part then there is a third part which is who you are who you are part is being identified based on your biometrics facial scan retina scan your your thumbprint handprint and what not now if you look look at that information is also now being captured by the the surveillance companies so all three parts of this authentication is now available through these surveillance providers and that is the the scary part which means they have all the sources to get into whatever information you know you have on their system or any other systems out there and it may not be an issue now but fast forward 5 years you know 10 years and that is going to that is going to get scary uh i think that's a good note to add on yeah there's a uh what do you call it soon we got to start doing a lot more about uh you know action items we can take and stuff like that we'll start a series here uh shortly on you know what people can do to protect themselves because otherwise um it can be a little depressing to think about these kind of things but um i think you broke down the even the mfa example pretty well in terms of um what it is that's actually happening but um identity is a a big part so we'll see um i guess where that goes but uh i guess we're rounding out about 45 minutes so we can wrap uh one thing i forgot to mention at the top but uh earlier this morning it was announced that uh apple's uh csam scanning was getting um delayed i guess they um in i would say non typical apple fashion they they listened to all the negative feedback they were getting and basically said we'll go back to the drawing board and figure out um what they're going to do so it's not going to pop up in iOS 15 right off the bat and uh it'll get delayed for a while and until they can figure out how to reword it to make it i guess a little bit more palatable for people so that was a i guess big news for today that is that is the reason to be vocal about it and that is the reason we are discussing about all of these topics is we have to be talking about our privacy and what it means and and it is important to be vocal that way we can we can make sure that these vendors are are questioned about some of the the power they have yeah i would say this was probably the best example because apple's not really known to like listen to customers that much but because there was so much of fuss and that means that like the fight is still worth fighting right like it's still we're talking about these things raising awareness and and that's really the most important thing if we just kind of rolled over then um you know we would get steamrolled so um i think that's a it's a breath of fresh air